It's the time of year, about 1,992 years ago, during the Passover, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He rested in the tomb, even on the Sabbath day, from redeeming mankind. And then he rose from the dead. And our subject this morning is gonna revolve around the subject of the resurrection. And I'll be giving you a little bit of personal information on why I believe in the resurrection. And keep in mind, I'm coming from a background where I was raised agnostic. But I'd like to begin with something that may surprise you a little bit. These are amazing facts about a movie. Now, I don't go to movies, but I bet most of you have seen Ben-Hur. I saw it too. It had the largest budget, over 15 million, of any movie made up to that time. It'd be about 150 million today. That'd probably be closer to 500 million today. I think Titanic was like $500 million budget. Can you imagine that? It had the largest sets built of any film production at the time. 100 costume wardrobe fabricators, 200 artists and workmen provided the hundreds of friezes and statutes needed for the film. Over 200 camels and 2,500 horses were used in making the film. Now, you know, Amazing Facts is involved in completing a film right now called Armageddon, The Final Events of Bible Prophecy, and ours is a low-budget film. But it's gonna be really, it's a big budget for us. But I can't imagine working with 2,500 horses. I mean, the crew that you'd need just to handle them. 10,000 extras were in the movie. The nine-minute chariot race has become one of cinema's most famous action sequences. And contrary to urban myths you heard, nobody died during that filming. It's the longest ever musical score composed and conducted by Mikolos Rosa. It had a $14.7 million marketing budget. It was the fastest growing as well as the highest grossing film of 1959, becoming the second highest grossing film in history at the time, only after Gone with the Wind. It won 11 Academy Awards. No picture has won more. Some pictures have tied for 11 Academy Awards. Epic film. Now, the reason I shared all that with you is because there's a backstory. Back in the 1870s, two men got on a train in North America. One of them was General Lee, Lee I'm sorry, General Lou Wallace, and he encountered another friend who had also fought in the Civil War with him on the side of the North. His name was Robert Ingersoll. Now, I don't know if you recognize the name Robert Ingersoll, but he was probably the most famous uh, American agnostic. Who He would go around and do uh, seminars and talk about how the Bible cannot be trusted and religion is a sham, and he talked to packed houses. He was very eloquent, went into politics and became a successful politician. They knew each other from the war, and Ingersoll asked General Wallace if he would like to sit with him in his coach. So they sat in their private coach, and um, they had a long ride going to this convention. They were both going to the same convention. And Ingersoll took in talking to Wallace about there is no God. The Bible cannot be trusted. And he waxed eloquent. It flowed like a river for hours. And uh, Wallace was not especially religious. He was rather indifferent to religion. But he was so rattled by what Ingersoll said that he resolved, you know, I need to study into this for myself because if what he's saying is true, nothing really matters. And he needed to find out. So he did a personal study on is there a God? Is the Bible true? And by the way, Wallace while he was once a general, afterward he was an attorney. So he looked at it from a logical, defensible position as a lawyer. Here's what he says. To write all of my reflections would require many pages. I pass them to say simply, 
that I resolved to study the subject. It only remains to say that I did as resolved with results. The first result is I wrote the book Ben-Hur. The second is a conviction amounting to absolute belief in God and the divinity of Christ. So that whole movie that became an epic film about the resurrection, it's what you would call historical fiction, it grew out of someone being challenged on the subject of, is the Bible true? Did Jesus really live? Did he rise from the dead? Now when I first heard this, I was a little shook. You know, I went to, I'm not Catholic, but I went to two different Catholic schools. And I remember hearing one time them talk about one of the prayers, they were teaching me the Beatitudes in one of our Bible classes, and they said, you know, Jesus, you know, he taught, and then he died on the cross, and then he rose from the dead the third day, and then he told his disciples to go out and teach. I said, wait, 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 let's back up. He what? He rose from the dead? I was only in third grade at the time. But I said, well, that doesn't happen every day. And I kind of struggled with it even back then. And so I was pretty much an agnostic until I began to search for is there a God when I was about 16, 17. And um, I kind of had to go through my own personal evaluation. Is this true? How would you know it's true? I mean, think, well, I'll admit that resurrections don't happen every day. It's what you would call a miracle. By the way, a miracle is called a miracle because they're not very common. Now, I'll tell you, I believe in miracles. I'll tell you when that started. I was in New York City, I was 16 years old. I was by myself, my mother had moved to England, my father and my brother lived in Florida. I needed a place to stay. I had one friend in New York City that I knew might take me in, his name was David McLean. David had been to my house, we went to school together, he was a good friend, but I'd never been to his house because his family didn't like me that much, probably rightly so, thought I was a bad influence, which I was. I ended up running away with David McLean at one point. But anyway, so I, I wanted to talk to him and see if he could help me out. And so I didn't have a phone number, so I went into the phone booth in New York City. You remember they had phone booths everywhere. And I opened the phone booth, and I opened the phone book. They had phone books in there to look up McLean. Do you know how many McLeans there are? in New York City, there were pages of it. And I was in the phone booth, and I thought, what am I gonna do? I have nowhere to stay, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And I slumped down, discouraged, in the phone booth, and David McLean walked by. <laughs> and I began to pound on the glass, and he jumped, he thought some lunatics in the phone booth. And, it, and I thought back on that, and I thought, there are eight million people in New York City. I had no idea where he lived. What were the chances that I would be in a phone booth at a corner, and there are 24 hours in a day, what are the chances that he would walk by at the moment when I was searching for him? And I thought, there has to be a God, or there's some cosmic force or intelligence out there. This could not happen by accident. And so, Stuff like that began to convince me there, there must be a God and there could be miracles. But how did I come to the point where I could believe in the resurrection? Well, I've got seven primary points. I may take a few rabbit trails along the way. First of all, two-thirds of American adults, there was a survey that was done by the a Life Study, and two-thirds of Americans, 66%, say they do believe in the biblical account of the physical resurrection of Jesus. But it's troubling when you realize that those that are between 18 and 30, 18 and 34, 59% do not believe. Meaning that the generation that is coming along, as you probably already heard from numerous studies, is becoming more and more agnostic and less and less believing in uh, Christianity, believing in God. Uh, things are changing in our culture. And I'd like to especially appeal to that group in my comments this morning. Why do I believe in the resurrection? One, it was foretold in the Bible. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he said that Jesus rose the third day as the scriptures say, according to the scriptures. There are many scriptures. You can look in the Old and the New Testament. Old Testament, Psalm 16, verse 10, you will not leave my soul in the grave. This is speaking of the Messiah. It didn't say wouldn't go to the grave. He said you wouldn't leave it there. Nor will your holy one, the Messiah, see corruption. Wouldn't be there long enough to decompose, which happens after the third day. Jesus Walking around when he was alive, he told them over and over. From that time, Matthew 16, 21, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests, be killed and rise the third day. He said it very frequently. He said it so frequently that even his enemies remembered this after he was crucified. They went to Pilate. You find this in Matthew 27, 63. They say, sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, after three days I will rise. They remembered it. That's why they requested a guard at the tomb, which of course just further proved that it did happen. It increased the number of witnesses. So there are so many prophecies. I mean, Jesus said, no sign will be given to this generation but the sign of Jonah. And the big sign of Jonah is, you know, it's not very likely that a person's going to come out of a fish alive after three days. Jonah's experience is a type of a resurrection. Indeed, Daniel coming out of the lion's den is a type of the resurrection. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego surviving the fiery furnace is a type of the resurrection. When Abraham goes up the mountain with Isaac and he's going to the place of sacrifice, and there's a substitute, and Isaac comes back alive, Paul tells us that that is a type of the resurrection. And so you've got all these different examples in the Bible where it looks like it was hopeless, and then things turned around. So the prophecies foretold this. Point number two, Jesus after death appearances. All the different times that he appeared after he died. According to the Apostle Paul's letters, as well as the four gospel accounts, Jesus appeared alive after his death on numerous occasions in diverse and varied ways. They saw him in the upper room. They saw him on the Mount of Olives. They saw him fishing at the Sea of Galilee. They saw him walking between Jerusalem and Emmaus and many other occasions that are not even recorded. It says over a period of 40 days he appeared. Now, look at how Paul describes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. And I think you're going to see this on the screen. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Notice he says, according to the Scriptures. This is what it said was going to happen and that he was seen by Cephas. Cephas is one of the names for Peter, same name. Then by the 12, notice 12, speaking those who were of the, the team of 12 apostles. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. Now friends, if I came you know, running in the room here and I said, wow, you won't believe it, I just talked to Gabriel. He said, you talked to Gabriel? Yeah, Gabriel the angel. You sure? Yeah, I saw this shadow, and then I heard this voice, and I'm sure it was Gabriel. You go, eh. Well, four people come in and say, we just saw Gabriel. They say, well, still, they maybe all had the same hallucination. But if we all came in and we said, we saw Gabriel, and we touched him. Then you say, what? Then if we all came in and we said, we saw him, he spoke to us, we spoke to him, we touched him, and we ate together. If people don't believe that, what evidence would you accept? What did Jesus have to do after the resurrection to prove he was real? What would you accept? If you won't accept that he walked and he talked and he ate and he appeared to them and they could touch him, he wasn't a phantom, and this is not one or two people. This is hundreds of people that saw him. I would think that's pretty compelling. Then it says he was also seen uh, the greater part, let me see, after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present. He said, when Paul writes this, he says, many are still alive if you want living witnesses. He's writing to the church in Corinth. But some have fallen asleep, some have died. After that he was seen by James. This is James, the brother 
of Jesus, who ends up becoming a leader of the church. Jesus especially appeared to his brother because you know the Bible says even his brethren did not believe. So Christ also appeared to those not only who did believe, he appeared to those who didn't believe. The apostle Paul certainly did not believe and Jesus appeared to him. Now if I was Jesus, I would have gone and appeared to like, you know, Pilate and made it really interesting. And this is then by all the apostles. Now he mentions the 12 up higher and so when it says apostles here, the word apostle there could also be talking about the 70 that were chosen. Remember he not only sent out 12, he sent out 70. And then it says last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. If anybody had no good reason to believe in the resurrection, it would be Paul. Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was trying to eradicate Christianity. Paul had everything to lose by making up this story of Jesus rising from the dead. Paul was extremely educated. Paul is one of the most quoted people in the world. You know how many people quote Paul and they don't even know it? The greatest of these is love, walk by faith, not by sight, not being under the law. I mean, you just, you can Google famous quotes of the Apostle Paul. You'll be shocked. He said, I saw it. So that's one reason. He appeared alive after his crucifixion. Now there are going to be some who say, this is not in my points, but some will say, well, that's because he wasn't really dead. They call it the swooning theory. They actually have some that have written books against the resurrection. They say he fainted on the cross. They thought he was dead. They took him down and they revived him. And that's how he appeared again because they can't get rid of the fact he appeared to so many. So they say, well, it's because he wasn't really dead. And then there are those who say, well, he actually drank a concoction. You know, when they put the sponge up to the cross, they gave him a drug and to put him into an induced coma so that they were able to keep him alive and then they resuscitated him later. He never really died. But they missed the whole part about the Roman soldier pushing a spear up into his heart and the blood and water draining out. Uh, no, he was dead. They inspected him. They used to make sure Romans would make sure that people were dead before they took him off the cross. And I won't go into the details of how they did that, but I mean, uh, they were very dead. They did not, not, there's no record of anyone ever surviving crucifixion. So, he appeared. The other reason I believe, point three, the short time frame between the events and the actual eyewitness claims. Now, so many people, when they tell a fantastic story, the story is written years later. It's like, you know, they say the city of Rome was founded by Romulus and Remus, who were nursed by a wolf. And this legend is written, you know, hundreds of years after they had all been dead and gone, and they just make up, you know, it's as true as Hercules or anything else. There's all kinds of interesting stories. When you read Homer's Odyssey, you wonder how much about the Battle of Troy and the Trojan Horse, how much of that is true? Uh, were, there, were there really sirens on the island calling the men into the rocks? Was there really a cyclops with one eye? Was there really a Medusa with snakes coming out of its head? I mean, because of some of the things in Greek mythology and these things, they say, well, how can that be true? But the Bible's written very differently. The Bible gives a lot of very accurate accounts of history and events of empires and customs of the day in great detail. And it not only talks about the good things the heroes do, it talks about their embarrassing failures. It is one of the most objective books of history that you could ever read. Where the other ones, you know, they always make the hero out to be this almost a divine champion that is beyond reality. But it'll tell you about King David killing Goliath and it'll tell you about David and Bathsheba. There's a short time frame for the Bible. You know that the first history of Alexander the Great was written by Diodorus Siclus 300 years after Alexander was dead. Now, today, you know, when we're writing about Christopher Columbus, we can't get our heads together about what to think about him. Because after hundreds of years go by, you just don't have that many documents. Nobody ever questions Alexander the Great, even though the first history was written 300 years after he was dead. Buddha, first history was written 600 years after he was dead. People don't question that Buddha lived. 
the people who were writing about Jesus knew him. When you read the Gospel of Mark, it's largely Peter dictating to Mark, Peter knew Jesus. They were first-hand witnesses. Luke, first-hand, well, Luke is actually interviewing, he's interviewing Mary and the different ones, so I guess he would be a second-hand witness. John, first-hand witness, Matthew, first-hand witness, and look at the differences. You got a doctor, you got a tax collector, you got a fisherman, and you got a teenager. Well, I don't know, John was a fisherman too, I suppose. And when you talk to an atheist and you say, well, we got the testimony of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John regarding the resurrection, they say, well, that doesn't count, they're Christians. And I go, well, help me, help me find an atheist that sees, the revela- that sees the resurrection that stays an atheist. Did you catch that? Yeah. Of course they're Christians. They saw the resurrection. If you're an atheist and you saw the resurrection, you'd be a Christian too. So you wanted me to find an atheist that can testify about the resurrection? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a circular argument. It's not going to work. There's a very short time frame The people who are writing about these things, as Paul said, they're alive, they're witnesses, hundreds of them. One of the most compelling points I've got listed as point number four is the sincerity of the witnesses. They absolutely believed what they were saying because they put their lives literally on the line. Most of the apostles died of unnatural causes, generally from persecution, because they were preaching and teaching the resurrection of Jesus. They had seen it, they were totally unafraid of death because they knew death had no fear for them because Jesus rose, and it should have no fear for you because Jesus rose. They had absolute confidence. Peter, at first, he was so afraid there in the... um, trial of Christ he denies Jesus but after the resurrection when they threatened Peter he said you decide whether I ought to obey God or you and they continued preaching about Jesus even though they were whipped and flogged for doing it so you look in the first century the gospel it takes off like a cannon shot it goes from no Christians to covering the Roman Empire why how could they do that so quickly because they believed what they were preaching was true. They put their lives, I mean, you know, some people will make up stories and deceive, but how many of you would be willing to die for something you knew to be a lie? No. They believed it. They saw it. The other reason when I talk about the sincerity, they not only talked about the wonderful things Jesus did, they confessed the embarrassing things they did. Peter confesses that he denied Jesus. They would never have normally said women were the first ones because according to Hebrew law, women were not trustworthy witnesses. They wouldn't have said Thomas denied it and said I won't believe it until I touch him and see him. They wouldn't have admitted we've gathered together for fear. I mean, you know, if you live the kind of life that I live and you grow up in New York City, you get pretty good at spotting a liar pretty quick. And my mother was an actress. That's all based on deception. By the way, you know, my mom was supposed to be in Ben-Hur. Did you know that? Yeah, my mother was in two movies with Charlton Heston. She was in Ten Commandments and The Buccaneer, very small parts. She would have been in Ben-Hur. But I was born in 1957, and they were taping it in 1958 and they discovered my brother had cystic fibrosis and she kind of gave up her acting after that. But I just thought I'd throw that in for fun trivia. So I knew actors, and you can tell when a person is, they're lying, the story just doesn't sit right. When I started reading through the Bible and listening to the accounts, I thought, this does not sound like a lie. This has the ring of truth. These people were absolutely convinced. And you know, while I'm thinking about it, Believing in the resurrection for me wasn't any harder than believing that God created things by speaking. I mean, let's admit it. Once you believe that God can speak the cosmos into existence, then why would you struggle with the idea that the God who did that could rise from the dead? Isn't that right? And so I was just dealing with the miraculous, uh, the miracles in the Bible. Could they be true? And so I, it, it didn't all happen all at once, but the more I looked at the evidence, I went through the same experience 
as C.S. Lewis and Lou Wallace and many others had said, what does the evidence say? So they were absolutely sincere. Then you've got the extra biblical accounts. It's not just the Bible talking about this. There are historians outside of the Bible that talk about it. You've got Christians and non-Christians, believers and unbelievers, and they admit it. Not only in the New Testament, you've got Tacitus. He was a Roman historian that had nothing good to say about Christians, but he acknowledged Jesus. He acknowledged that Jesus was crucified. He says Jesus was crucified by Pilate. He was a historian during the time of Emperor Tiberius. You've got Josephus, Lucian, the Talmud, Clement of Rome, Ignatius, Polycarp, Barnabas, Justin Martyr, etc. They're all living outside of the Bible. They're all recent reports, many of them contemporaries with those who witnessed it, and they talk about the events as though they're absolute history. You know, friends, if you're gonna believe anything you ever read in history, you're not gonna find more uh, in ancient history than you're gonna find on the resurrection of Jesus and the times of Jesus. There is a reason that history today is dated from his birth. So, let me give you one example. I talked to you a minute ago about James. Jesus appeared to James. Not only does it mention that in the Bible, Here's from the writings of Josephus. Josephus is a Jewish historian and uh, Flavius Josephus. He actually witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem. He was spared. He ended up being adopted into one of the Roman families and they, asked, they tasked him with writing the history of the Jews so they would have it. The Romans were big on libraries and wanted to know what happened and so he wrote the history and he wrote a lot more than they probably wanted. Here's one segment from Antiquities, Book of the Jews, Book 20, Chapter 9. Festus was now dead, and Albinus was but upon the road, so he assembled the Sanhedrin judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others, or some of his companions. And when they formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. Well, this is what other historians tell us. James was stoned in Jerusalem. And this is years after he was sort of the chairman of the board for the early church. It's in history. So if you're not gonna believe these things, what will you believe? The other reason I believe is it is a central, pivotal teaching throughout the New Testament. The teaching of Jesus rising is really the axle on which the gospel rotates. Acts chapter two, as soon as the Holy Spirit poured out, what does Peter say? Acts chapter two, verse 23. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Paul, Acts 17, verse two. Then Paul, as his custom was, what did Paul do as a regular custom? He went into them and three Sabbaths, he reasoned to them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer, rise again from the dead. Paul is explaining from the scriptures, not the New Testament, that the Messiah would rise from the dead. This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Paul would have had nothing to gain by doing that and on many occasions he got stoned because to say that Jesus could rise from the dead was putting him on a level with God. They called that blasphemy. Acts 5.29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus who you murdered by hanging on a tree. Romans 8.11. But if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you life in your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. See, it's also very important to believe in the resurrection because the gospel salvation components rest upon it. Did you catch that? The resurrection of Jesus is like the, it's the kingpin, the linchpin that holds together the gospel. Paul is saying because he rose, this miraculous power of new life is the same spirit that raised up Jesus that gives you new life. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, it's connected with the second coming. 
and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Hebrews 13 verse 20. Now may the, may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight through Christ Jesus in whom be glory forever and ever, amen. Raised from the dead, raised from the dead. Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days, what would happen? I will raise it up. The whole message the, the punctuation, the exclamation mark that Jesus makes on everything else he said earlier is that he would rise from the dead. If you wondered if he was the son of God, he said, well, I'll prove it. He said, I lay down my life and I take it up again. I mean, you gotta be pretty powerful to raise yourself. Wouldn't you say? And then of course, point number seven, the empty grave. Oh, I think that is actually a point. They went to the grave. They had put his body in the grave. You got all these gospel testimonies. They laid him in the grave. He was dead. Tells where the grave came from. Tells how the body got to the grave. Joseph of Arimathea, who was one of the Sanhedrin that did not support the decision. He was not invited to the kangaroo court when they convicted Jesus. He went and begged the body of Jesus from Pilate. Once it was confirmed he was dead, he was given the body. He and Nicodemus worked together to buy the ointment. They delivered the project to the women who oversaw the wrapping of his body. I mean, they're wrapping his dead body. He would have suffocated if he was just in a coma. They wrapped up his head. And they went to finish getting the spices, but the Sabbath was coming. You know, I always thought this was a really good argument for the Sabbath truth. Jesus spent three and a half years walking among the disciples teaching and they never got the slightest impression from him the Sabbath wasn't important because one of the last things that happens when he dies on the cross as the sun is going down, they would not finish that loving work of embalming his body because the Sabbath was approaching. They didn't think that would please him and they come back Sunday morning. To say that the early believers did not think the Sabbath was important so they come back Sunday to finish the process and they want the stone rolled away but it's already rolled away. And they all say they walk in and the grave is empty. And you know what? One of the other things that convinced me is the disagreement or at least apparent disagreement. It says Mary Magdalene was there first but then it says the women went to the tomb. And it not only names three or four women but then it says and the others. So there were several women that went and the sequence in talks about Peter coming. Evidently, Mary gets there first. She's supposed to meet the other women there at the tomb. They then come. They see he's gone. They leave. She goes to find Peter and John. Peter and John come back. They leave. She's there by herself, and then Jesus appears to her first. That's another thing. If you're going to rise from the dead, why would you appear first to a woman that's got a bad reputation if you want people to believe the story? Now, Jesus did that strategically because he wants us to know that he forgives sin, and he will use the humblest instruments. But that would not be the way you would orchestrate it if you were going to fabricate it. You'd get the most credible person. And so you've got all these things happening that day where he appears to Peter, he appears to James, he appears to two on the road to Emmaus, then he appears in the upper room. He eats in front of them. Then he appears by the sea, has long conversations, cooks them breakfast. I mean... What more could he do to show that he was alive? The empty grave. Well, they could have snuck his body away. You know, the Roman soldiers were later paid to say that they stole the body away. But really, I mean, can you picture the apostles, the guards there around the tomb? They quietly tipped over over these Roman soldiers that are all snoring so heavenly. They don't hear them wrestling this stone aside from the tomb. And they don't wake them up. They all sleep through it. And a Roman soldier, if it loses its charge, they lose their life. That's why they said the soldiers were afraid and the priest said, we'll pay Pilate if it comes to his ears. Don't worry. We'll pay you, we'll, we'll cover it. And that's how they got that false testimony. But you know what? I think some of the soldiers couldn't keep it to themselves. They said, yeah, we got paid. But yeah, he, we saw the angels. How could you forget that? They saw it. It was real. And the little discrepancies, one time it says there's one angel, another story says there were two angels, and they all come different times. They see different angels. 
when Jesus' birth was announced, there's different numbers of angels that are there. First is one angel, then the heavens are full of angels. That doesn't bother me. That to me reinforces it. You've got the account of different people. They're obviously not copying from each other. You see what I'm saying? And then another reason I believe in the resurrection is because it wasn't the first time. You know, there are about 12 resurrections in the Bible. I'm gonna go through them quickly for you. First resurrection is Moses. Now, the Bible tells us that Moses was buried, the Lord buried him, and then you don't know about the resurrection until you get to the New Testament, the book of James, I'm sorry, book of Jude, verse nine, says Michael comes for the body of Moses, obviously to resurrect. God doesn't have a mortuary in heaven. He's coming to resurrect him, not just to move the body. And the devil wants to argue, and Michael says, the Lord rebuke you. And then you see Moses appears in the New Testament. He's obviously resurrected. Now, he's not the first one to go to heaven. That would be Enoch, because Enoch did not die, so you can't call that a resurrection. That's a translation. So you got Moses, then you got the widow of Zarephath, her son. Elijah is staying with this widow. Her boy dies. Elijah resurrects the boy. Then Elisha, who's got a double portion of Elijah's spirit, he duplicates the miracle. He is staying in an upper room with this Shunammite woman. And this boy is working in the field with his father, and he dies, and he is resurrected. By the way, each of these resurrections are types of Christ in the Old Testament. Then you've got Elisha resurrects. He had a double portion of the spirit because he does two resurrections. Even after he's dead, the Bible says they went and they threw a body in on the bones of Elisha because some Moabite raiders were coming through the land and they couldn't finish the funeral and he came back to life. That's a lot of spirit. He had so much residual spirit that even after he was dead, he raised somebody. So this man is raised. We don't know what his name is. Then you go to the New Testament and Jesus resurrects the daughter of Jairus. She has just died and has not been buried yet or not been prepared for burial. So you've got that resurrection. Then Jesus resurrects the widow of Nain's son. And this you'll find in Luke 7, verse 11. They're on the way to the cemetery and he stops the procession and he raises the boy to life. Then you get to the story of Lazarus in John chapter 11. And now Lazarus has not only died, he's not only gone to the burial, he has been dead for four days and Jesus raises Lazarus. Then you've got the, the greatest of all, you've got the resurrection of Jesus you find in multiple gospel, gospel accounts. But when Jesus died, when, his, uh, when he died on the cross, it says there was an earthquake that opened up a number of graves around Jerusalem, and after the resurrection of Jesus, many of the saints, not all, but there was a small group of saints that appeared, and they went into the city, and they appeared to others from some of the believers from times past. Then going into the book of Acts, you have the resurrection of Dorcas by Peter. She was dead, all wrapped up, ready for burial. Eutychus falls out a window when Paul is preaching, which is a lesson for preachers not to preach too long because it can be hazardous. And it says he was taken up dead. Paul went down, he prayed over him and said his life is yet in him. And he came back to life with no harm done. And then the Twelfth one, I can't prove, but you know the Bible says in Acts chapter 14, verse 19, Paul was stoned and they left him for dead and even the disciples presumed he was dead and then suddenly he got up. And we'll have to get to heaven and ask, but I don't know, he may have been dead. And since no one was praying over his resurrection, the Lord said, Paul, I'm not done with you yet and he just raised him up. And then of course we know that there'll be a big resurrection when Jesus comes. 1 Corinthians 15, some people say, you know, if, if Jesus hasn't raised, then what hope do we have? Let me tell you why this doctrine is so important, friends. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. Your faith is also empty. We're wasting our time here today. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified that God raised him up. Whom, if, if God did not raise up Christ, 
In fact, the dead don't rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. See how important the resurrection is? Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, they perish. They're done for. All those funerals you went to where they talked about the hope, a waste of time. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. Paul says, if you don't believe in the resurrection, everything falls and stands on the resurrection of Jesus. But I like the words of triumph in verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead. Amen? And has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man, man meaning Adam came death, by man Jesus came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but each one in his own order. This tells you what the order, that people don't die and go right to heaven. When does it happen? It says, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Can you say amen? amen? Is there a resurrection? Do the dead rise? You know, friends, all I've got to do is just look at, you know, a monarch butterfly or any butterfly. You think about what a miracle that is. And here this caterpillar, after eating like crazy, it then forms a chrysalis, cocoon, and it goes through this transformation, this metamorphosis that uh, the chemicals turn into a soup and they reorganize and this fat worm emerges as a delicate, elegant flying machine with color. It's just, I mean, who can explain that? How would evolution ever account for that? You know, there's a fish called a lungfish. You find them in Africa that during times of drought, you know what they do? They burrow in the mud when they realize the water's running out in their river, and they emit this mucus that surrounds their body. They wiggle around, eventually that mucus hardens and forms a shell, and they leave one little pinhole, and they shut down their metabolism, and they stay there stuck in the mud for up to three years with no rain. Just breathe in enough to keep them alive, evidently. And then the rains come, it melts the cocoon, and they come back to life. Look at these frogs up in the north, toads. They look like rocks. You find them under rocks. They freeze as it looks like as hard as a rock, but they got a little bit of antifreeze. Evolution's amazing. I'm saying that tongue in cheek. They got this antifreeze. They just stay totally frozen, but just enough antifreeze in their blood to keep it from totally freezing, and it warms up. They shake themselves and they hop off. And so when the Bible says that the creator, the son of God, came into the world as a man, and after he was executed, even after foretelling three time, several times that he was going to rise from the dead and that he rose from the dead, well, I believe it. I believe it because it's in the Bible. I believe it because it makes sense. I believe it because I see how it transforms the lives of people who believe it. The whole world is better for it. You know, there was one quote I didn't read you from Josephus. This is a Jewish historian. It's not in the Bible, but he's a fairly accurate historian. And this is from his book, Antiquities, chapter 18, 63. About this time lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed you ought to call him a man, for he was an achiever of extraordinary deeds and a teacher of those who accept the truth gladly. He won over many of the Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah. When he was indicted by principal men among us and Pilate condemned him to be crucified, those who had come to love him originally did not cease to do so. For he appeared to them on the third day restored to life as the prophets of the deity had foretold. And these and countless other marvelous things about him and the tribe of the Christians so named after him has not disappeared to this day. This is someone who lived during the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. And... He confessed, he's a Jew, and he said he was the Messiah. So if you're not going to accept this evidence, then I would ask, what evidence would you accept? Some people just refuse to believe. The seed falls on the stony ground, and they just don't realize 
that there is evidence for your faith. I remember reading a story about a missionary in Brazil and he was working with this remote tribe in the Amazon and many of them were struggling with illness and they had a clinic not too far away from this river but they would not cross the river because, and it's not that they were afraid of rivers, they crossed many rivers, but there's one river that went between them and where the clinic was, they believed it was filled with evil spirits. And a, a plague started going through the whole tribe and many were dying and the missionary begged them to follow him across the river and he said, all will be well. He said, you go to the hospital, they'll give you medicine. They said, we can't go in there, there's evil spirits. And so the missionary, he went down by the edge of the river and he put his feet in the river. They said, look, nothing's happening to me, come. They said, no, 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 no. And he got down knee deep and he splashed in the water. And they looked at him, waiting for something bad to happen to him. And he said, you can make it. And they said, no, evil spirits. Finally, he realized his only hope was he dove in the river. He's a good swimmer. He disappeared. And he swam as far as he could underwater and he came up on the other side. And then he waved at them. And they all jumped on the shore and they cheered. And they were then willing, when they saw that he had gone across to the other side, to take the plunge of faith. Now we have someone that has gone before us, and he came up alive on the other side. This life is not it. This life is preparation for the life that really matters. Death is not the end for the Christian. Because he lives, we can, we can live a new life then, but we can live a new life now because of the resurrection. That same power and spirit that brought him back to life can change your heart. It can give you a new heart. It can give you victory over your sins and the devil just like it gave victory to Jesus over death. If you believe, all things are possible. It's sad when people believe a lie. It's sadder still when people refuse to believe the truth. Jesus rising is the truth, friends. 